Hi, welcome back to the DBS View. The overdue correction in global equities has arrived, albeit a bit late for the so-called spring swoon. It started with the Nikkei a couple of weeks ago, but this is not primarily about Japan. The Nikkei had been flashing technically overbought signals for a couple of weeks before the big sell-off started late May. Indeed, we saw the same overbought signals a few weeks ago in the Singapore and Hong Kong stock markets, and they have both been correcting since. Now, US stocks, they have been hanging in there over the past few weeks, but they are now in overbought territory. A correction appears to have started there as well. But this is likely to be a correction to rather than a termination of the equities uptrend. Nevertheless, we caution that three things have to be true for continuation of the rally. One, government bond yields must remain tame. Two, quantitative easing is not scaled back until the US economy develops clearer upward momentum. And three, global corporate earnings have to continue to grow. And our conclusion is that all the above conditions are likely to prevail over the course of this year, despite the noise of the debate that from time to time spooks overbought markets. The biggest single driver of the rising volatility is concern over the end of cheap and plentiful money. Now, the recent comments by various Fed leaders, Federal Reserve leaders, although not definitive either way, they have created market anxieties of an easing in the scale of the Fed's asset purchase program. But the contractionary reading on the China Manufacturing PMI or Purchasing Managers Index was an added boot in the gut, a cautionary note of what is likely to happen when markets fear the end of easy money before the arrival of a robust global economy. Now, the good news is that quantitative easing is likely to continue through the course of this year, with the possibility of a tapering of the size of asset purchases only late this year if the U.S. economy continues to improve at the current rate. A broad sweep of the data emerging out of the U.S. suggests the economy is improving, but not so fast as to trigger an imminent end to the Fed's asset purchase program. Three reasons why tapering of QE is not imminent. One, and this is the most important reason, the evidence of sustainable economic recovery remains patchy, something we have characterized as the once and a half steps forward, one step back nature of the data. Indeed, even the declining unemployment rate has to be taken with a huge chunk of salt. A large part of that has been due to the declining labor force participation rate. Point two, fiscal drag is slowly working through the US economy as a result of the so-called sequester, that is, those program cuts to government spending. Point three, inflation has been easing rather than rising, as many feared QE would result in. And even when it does occur, the eventual tapering of QE is not necessarily the end of the equities bull market either. Yes, there will be some upward pressure on US Treasury yields with a tapering of Federal Reserve purchases. But historically, US Treasury yield trends have been determined by the Fed Fund's target rate. And unless there is any suggestion that the Fed Fund's target rate is about to rise, Fears about a major reversal in U.S. Treasury yields appear unjustified. Further, it is likely to be the manner of an eventual exit from QE, and not exit per se, that will determine the fate of asset markets. That is, if the economy is strong enough to sustain corporate earnings growth without support from asset purchases, well, the uptrend continues. Which brings us to the point about earnings which should continue upwards. That the S&P 500 appears to have recently run ahead of earnings is a concern, but the consensus is that earnings growth momentum should pick up over coming quarters to justify the gains in the index. Price to earnings valuations are no longer as cheap as they were a year ago, but that's obvious. But then again, they are still at what might be called mid-cycle rather than late cycle. They are not yet where they might signal an imminent end to the bull market. Now we move from the US to Japan. JGB yields are not signaling the failure of Abenomics. Remember, the Japanese economy is turning. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's three-arrow strategy 
was about one, monetary expansion, two, fiscal stimulus to lift the economy out of deflation, and then three, economic reforms to sustain that growth momentum. Remember that as part of his plan, he wants to create 2% inflation. If anything, the rise in JGB yields is a measure of how seriously the market takes his plans. That is, investors are doing what the government wants, moving out of government bonds and cash and into risk assets such as equities and real estate. Further, the rise in yields should be seen in historical context. The 10-year JGB yield has been on a downtrend dating back to 2007-2008. And the latest move up should be seen in the context of normalization of an abnormal deflationary trend. It is entirely within the abenomic scheme of things to have slightly higher government bond yields in the context of more economic activity. Remember, economic activity is the denominator of the debt to GDP ratio. And also, more economic activity will generate more tax revenue for the government to offset higher government financing charges. Also remember that under its asset purchase program, the Bank of Japan can and will buy JGBs to hold down yields. What we are witnessing in Japan is possibly the start of a paradigm shift. The plan to double the, country, to double the country's monetary base to boost inflation has profound implications. Uh, for the psychology of Japanese savers. In a country with an aging demographic, savings and deflation feed on each other. That is, retirees with large savings do not mind deflation, but it sacrifices the prospects of future generations. In turn, a large hoard of savings and bank deposits and government bonds reinforce deflationary tendencies, breaking Japan's deflationary spiral dramatically cheapening the yen and hopefully introducing a wave of structural reforms could set the stage for a long-term move in Japanese asset prices that could last years, notwithstanding occasional bouts of corrections. Strategy implications. Now stand back for a while to see how long this correction in global equities lasts. The levels of cash holdings in money market funds and bank deposits remain elevated in the major markets. And as long as deposit rates stay in negative real territory, that is, you get negative returns in inflation adjusted terms, well, the hunger for yields will continue to support equities on a pullback. This has been, for the most part, an underparticipated bull market. The money is still sitting on the sidelines. And while valuations are no longer as cheap as they were a year ago, they're not expensive either in cyclical terms. Meanwhile, corporate earnings should continue to push high over coming quarters. As for Japan, if you are already holding equities, hang in there. If you don't, use this correction as an opportunity to join what we think will be a multi-year upward trend in stock prices. And we would continue to short the yen, long Japanese stocks, and we will continue to overweight equities globally will continue to overweight Japan. Thank you for joining us for the DBS View.